TheFirmanSermon.com. The following program is sponsored by Rosenthal Wealth Management. Larry Rosenthal is a registered representative offering securities and advisory services through Satera Advisor Networks, LLC, a broker, dealer, and registered investment advisor, member FEMRA SIPC. Satera is under its separate ownership for Rosenthal Wealth Management Group. Rosenthal Wealth Management Group is located at 9265 Corporate Circle in Manassas, Virginia, and can be reached at 703-330-3100. Chris McKay is not affiliated with Satera Advisor Networks, LLC, nor at Rosenthal Wealth Management Group. Bob Jones is a marketing assistant of Rosenthal Wealth Management Group and is associated with Satera Advisor Networks, LLC. It's time now for Making Money Sense with Larry Rosenthal. Larry is recognized as one of the nation's leading financial and retirement planners and is here right now to answer your questions. Author, speaker, and talk show host, Larry Rosenthal, is dedicated to teaching others financial stewardship from a biblical point of view. Call Larry now. Studio lines are open at 855-767-3123. That's 855-ROSE-123. Making Money Sense is on the air. Well, welcome to Making Money Sense, the Larry Rosenthal Show. It is good to see you, sir. Well, it's good to see you too, Chris. And how are you doing? So far, so good today. I feel having a good Saturday morning so far? I'm having a great Saturday morning so far. Nice, nice. I like to hear it's that. A little I like chilly, to hear that. but other than that, I'll get by. Well, you know, it's funny. It happens every time this year. Yeah, winter, something you like know? that. <laughs> winter. There you go. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Yep. Yeah. So hopefully everybody's out skiing. Uh, you know, if you're skiing this this week, I hope you're having a, a good time and you got some good snow. So, Sweet. but uh, whatever's going on in winter, just enjoy. Hey, you know, so <clears throat> let's talk about. Uh, boy, we've got a lot to talk about right now. <laughs> we always do, and it's a lot of fun. You sound like, like an automobile going into gear. You know, you're, if you're first gear, now you're second. Now it's really got a lot of. Let's gear. roll. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, a couple of quick things, uh, some announcements. Um, uh, so we're going to do something a little different this year. You know, every month we roll out, uh, except for the summer months, we roll out educational webinars uh, for people, and people attend from all over the nation on them. And so what we decided to do this year was if you go visit my website, LarryRosenthal.com, and kick on seminars and events, you're going to see an entire list of them there. We've got all the subject matters, all the titles, and next week we'll populate them with links to to register but go check it out this way you can just sort of sit back and take a look we're going to be delivering lots of continuing education for everybody in the financial planning uh, world uh, you know to learn how to properly manage uh, wealth how to grow it how to maintain it reduce taxes charitable giving the whole nine yards and estate planning so this week in the markets markets were kind of uh, looking for some direction a little bit you know the markets were really waiting on Thursday's inflation report and then Friday's producer price index report inflation came out hot for December it was est estimated to be up 3.2 percent and actually came in at 3.4 which made the markets get a little nervous and a little shaky on Thursday but then followed up with a reduction in PPI on Friday which is the producer price index which basically is cost of goods what does it take for somebody to produce something that went down it went down a little bit more than anticipated so, so it sort of sort of leveled things out a little uh, from the standpoint of where is inflation now but then backing it up in in uh, you know from the Fed's view there they they actually came out this week and and talked a little bit about you know they feel that in that interest rates are high enough right now to continue on a slow decline bring inflation down which is which is great and they're just going to be data dependent so we are in stage two of this cycle right now stage one was raising rates stage two is pausing waiting to see where we are and then stage three probably somewhere in the springtime maybe memorial day weekend maybe even into july 4th somewhere in there we should start to see the fed act a little bit and possibly start to to bring rates down slightly it, again it's going to depend on these readings over the next three or four months but what that does is it moves the fed from being against the wind against us to in our camp now they're just sort of sitting on the bench waiting which is good 
Okay, we don't want them pitching balls, right? We want them on the bench. It basically is 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 where we are. So so that's good from that standpoint, getting that in our rearview mirror. So now quickly, Wall Street pivots its eyes very fast, as it should, to the fundamentals of the economy. What's going on? And as we know, the primary reason people buy stock is based off of <clears throat> the anticipation of corporate earnings. You know, company A says, hey, things are great. Company B says we can't sell anything anymore. You want to buy company A stock, right? So when you look at the broad scope of how are co company earnings doing, that's a good indication of where stock prices could end up going. So we're, this coming week, we're going to get a ton of companies starting to report in the fourth quarter earnings. So we're all, you know, first quarter of 2024, companies are reporting their fourth quarter earnings of 2023. And it's compared fourth quarter of 2022 versus fourth quarter 2023. It's a year over year re, um, comparison and it's published quarterly. And it looks like the estimates in the S&P as an aggregate here are going to be probably increased about 4.4 percent. That's by LESG and they, they were talking about that data on Friday. So those are some of the latest numbers. It, it's down from 5.2 and that's okay. Uh, but but we are starting to see a little bit of a slowdown because interest rates are a little bit higher and and that's to be understood um, you know the, but but we're talking about you know analysts have come out and said in 2024 <clears throat> they expect to see earnings rise by about 11 hmm. percent and and that's a big number you know so so it could be it could be boating up to be a very good year some of the big banks have reported that they're starting to see consumer debt start to reach or start to return back to pre-pandemic levels as well. So I don't like that story uh, too much. Yeah. We've been watching that, and, and we're starting to see that happen. Um, but at the same time, we're also starting to see corporate earnings grow and, and get back in fold there. So <clears throat> how soft landing. How much of landing? that is a responsible business about getting into debt, or how much of that is just because – they don't have the income to be able to not do that. You know, it's still a catch-up game, Chris. There, there's still not enough income to pay the pay the yeah. bills in a lot of cases right now, uh, because that is because there is inflation issues, and right. we're starting to see the again inflation numbers month over month are coming down. But more importantly, PCE, which is the Fed's number one um, tool or measurement stick, if you will, personal consumption and expenditures. They're looking to see where people are buying different things. For example, you go into the grocery store, Chris, and you buy cereal. Right. And your brand name cereal, let's say, is, is I don't know, $5 a box, okay? Mm -hmm. And now you say, well, I'm still hungry in the morning. I still want cereal. But instead of getting the one for $5 a box, which has price. now gone to $7 a box, yeah. I'm going to switch to an off-brand and get one for $4 a box. I'm mm -hmm. still eating breakfast. You're still doing the same consumer function, but you've, you, you've made an alternative pricing choice okay you're not skipping it and that's what that's what the fed's looking at personal consumptions where's chris spending his money right. and expenditures okay does that mean so buying less of a house does that mean buying also you know less of a car yeah well yeah when capital yeah, exactly you know you if you started to say hey i want to go finance a car last year and you said i'm going to wait till christmas and do it you know well hey that car payment probably went up a hundred bucks a month yeah, at least. Uh, before you went ahead and bought it the same with the well, same with a house you know you can go people are still buying homes i was talking with a client this week and we were breaking down the real estate market and i was showing her that you know <clears throat> where things are right now and talking about go back in time the last time we had accelerating interest rates with accelerating housing prices was back in the 80s and that was simply due to supply and demand mm -hmm. you know back then you had a whole bunch of baby boomers that needed to sort of get out of the parents basements right and and go buy a home so we had a lot of supply i'm sorry we had a lot of demand for less supply in the housing sector same thing going on now <clears throat> a lot of millennials are getting to that age right around 30 or so and they're looking to buy homes they're looking to purchase and they're getting out of this quote-unquote rent game that they were doing for a while and now they're saying maybe home ownership's not that bad of an of, of an option and so you've got a big amount of people looking for homes coming out of the pandemic 
where we basically stopped building for a year and a half mm -hmm. almost, mm -hmm. right? Okay, so there's less supply there still catching up. But then on top of that, you take a look at, at other people. Many, many people are saying, I'm not going to sell my home now and move to the other home that I want because my current interest rate is 3%. I have to go get a 6.5% rate. So they're sitting tight. Okay, so again, less supply, but we have demand. So now we're seeing rates going up, but real estate prices are still being stubborn. And that's probably yeah. going to last for another handful of years. It which is like a, it's, it's actually cheaper to almost build your own home than buy existing construction, I've noticed. I don't it know could what, very well be, yeah. you know, and that's probably kind of a one-on-one -on -one with the, the builders and things like that. Yeah. But all in all, you know, this year the markets, you know, we're still we're, we're not waving the all-green flag yet. But, you know, last year I kept telling people – I don't see the recession. If anything, it'll be a small slowdown, or maybe a slight recession. So, so so far that's been that's been called correctly. And I've been saying, you know, hey, in twenty twenty four we could very well hit market highs again, and we're almost there right now. Wow. Uh, so so so, and that's just based off of the Fed and time and corporate earnings and the consumer and things like that. So the economy's healthy, which is very good, and it's time in the market. Uh, it, it really is. I had a, a, a just a, a wonderful conversation. I wanted to have it longer, but we were at a, a dinner setting this week, and, and uh, a friend of mine's daughter was there. She's in high school, and we were, she was asking about interest and things like that, oh. and she's investing you know a few dollars each month nice. into, into some investments, and we started talking about compound interest yeah. and time. And, and that's the secret here. If people can understand, it's time in the market. What is it? It's time. It's acquisition of shares and things like Boy, that. Boy, I wish so, I was more interested in this stuff when I was in high school. Man. Everybody does. That's exactly right. Yeah. So, hey, give us a ring this morning at 855-ROSE-123. That's 855-ROSE-123. 855-767-3123. Let's open up the phone lines. Give us a call. It's Open Mic Saturday, which means any questions at all, call us on your retirement plans, on estate plans tax law changes you know what's what's going on in your in your fi uh, financial plan charitable giving insurance whatever's on your mind today give us a ring 855 rose 123 I'm Larry Rosenthal we'll be back in a moment with more of your making money sense You are listening to Making Money Sense live with Larry Rosenthal. Phone lines are open for your retirement and financial planning questions at 855-ROSE-123. That's 855-767-3123. More Making Money Sense in a moment. And here's another Money Minute with Larry Rosenthal. So many different ways to invest money. Lump sum deposits, buy and hold, market timing. How about dollar cost averaging? Put the same amount of money into the same investment at every interval, whether it's monthly, quarterly, annually, whatever it may be. This gives you the greatest opportunity to get the average price over the long term of the investment because one of the secrets to creating wealth is the acquisition of shares. You want to keep buying more and more shares over time. On the flip side, when you're in your retirement years and you want to distribute dollars to yourself for income, do the same thing in reverse dollar cost average out during your retirement years. You've seen and heard him on Fox Business, CNBC, and The Wall Street Journal. Larry Rosenthal is here right now to take your calls at 855-767-3123. That's 855-ROSE-123. This is The Larry Rosenthal Show. Welcome back to The Larry Rosenthal Show. We'd like to have you call us and talk to Larry this morning. If you have an opportunity to do so, 855 767 Three one two three. That's eight five five Rose one two three. To talk to Larry Rosenthal, right here live in studio. Larry. Good morning, Kay. How are you today? Doing wonderful, thank you. I have a, a interesting question. I'm in a situation where I'm, you know, in my sixties. I'm looking to. I sold my home. I'm looking to either rent, buy, or build. 
what are what are my options? Do you think at my age? Well, the best investment. I think you just listed it out: rent, buy, or build. Okay, <laughs> so let's break this down a little bit here, Kay. Um, do, is is the location that you're moving into? Is this where you want to stay for a long period of time? I'm still kind of looking. I'm trying to find what would be the best state for me to move to. Then I would definitely I recommend, you know, at this point, renting until you find the location that you want to stay in. You know, um, you know, it's it's not going to do you any good to build a place where you are now and then go through that process for the next year and a half, and then all of a sudden, you know, five months after you move into it, decide you want to move from Alabama to Montana or wherever. You know, you, you would be at risk of, of, of losing a lot of money at that point versus just sticking the money in the bank. Now, I understand you're, you're not building any equity by renting, but I think it's more important at first to, to – ask the question, you, you sort of said, what's the best from an investment standpoint? Um, <clears throat> we, we have to, when we're looking at real estate, you have to decide, do you want this home that you're talking about to be shelter, where you can be there with family and friends, or do you want it to lean more toward a real estate investment? So you need to treat it one way or the other. Now, the good news is that real estate traditionally is an appreciating asset, so if you're looking at I – would, I would approach this first as shelter, family, friends, gathering place, that type of a scenario. So I would find the place, the location that you want to be in first. Once you, once you settle on that, then let's get a realtor. Let's shop around, and you can also look at different neighborhoods that are being built and speak to builders and stuff like that and see – you know, if you fall in love with a new house that's already built – that's a much quicker entry versus going to build one yourself right there. But I would treat it as family, uh, shelter, you know, where you're going to meet with friends, families, kids, grandkids, that type of scenario versus real estate investment first. Okay, so just invest my money in something else first for the first well, year or two. Well, where are you living right now? In a rental. Okay. And in this rental, are you shopping around in the same state, same location to find a real estate, uh, to find a home? Or are you looking uh, outside of your area? What, what, what's your plan here? You know? I mean, there's I'm nothing, there's outside. also I'm nothing wrong at, with, well, with there, pardon me? I'm looking around to see which state is warm and which state has the um, lowest cost of living that still stays as an older person. I get it. So after you go through that process, then then you can determine if it's best to, 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 to build or buy a place or even move there and rent. One of the issues, too, that when you're looking at buying a place is make sure you don't end up being house rich and cash poor. Unfortunately, I've seen that happen as well to people where you buy this new retirement home. It uses a lot of your cash, but now you don't have a lot of money to do discretionary things with. So make sure that you've got that balance, uh, that thing balanced out correctly, okay? And if you want, I'll, I'll, I'll send you out our toolkit, and we can have one of our advisors help you. We, we, just the other day, we were pulling up for somebody a list of states that don't tax retirement plans. So there's a lot of different ways that we right. might be able to help you you know, look look across the country and in different counties from that standpoint to make sure things are more efficient for you, if you'd like, okay? Yeah, I've been looking at, at those tax-free places. What I'm looking at is, say, if, if I have a place, would it be better for me to own someplace? Or how would I leave? A, I guess what I'm trying to well, say is if I build something, well, how do I leave a legacy for my kids? How do I leave money for my kids? Long term, real estate, you know, it's a good long, long term. term. Usually, real estate is a good investment from that standpoint. But how do you leave a legacy for your for your kids? Any assets that you own, you just need to point the beneficiary to whomever you want it to go to, whether it's through a trust or just a beneficiary form. 
and you can attach a beneficiary form, transfer on death uh, for real estate, or you can place it into a trust. Yep. So now if we're opening up the discussion to how do you how do you leave your assets to your heirs, first of all, you know, you've got to look at estate planning in two ways. One, while you're alive, and two, when you when you pass. When you pass, assets are gonna to go to your heirs, the IRS, or charities. And 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 with doing some planning, you can minimize exposure to the IRS and give efficient, you know, transfers to your heirs and to charities. So maybe we start there. Maybe we take a look at shopping real estate, finding a place that's affordable, safe, and then taking a look at how to pass assets on to your heirs. You know, also passing real estate on to heirs a lot of times is, is a challenge. Let's suppose you have two children Ooh, okay. and one wants to move in and the other one wants to run it out or one wants to run it out and the other one wants to sell their piece out. Now what are you going to do, right? So sometimes leaving real estate to kids or to other people is a challenge because, again, they have legal ownership and two of them want to do different things with it. Now what happens? So you have to make provisions for that in your will or in your trust and things of that nature. So think about, you know, list out the different assets that you have and then how you want those to go and to whom and when. And that's the most efficient way. That's what we take to an estate planning attorney to say, okay, let's do a will and possibly a trust around the wishes that Kay has right here in, you know, in the state of Alabama. So, Kay, I'm going to put you on hold here. I'm going to have Bob get your information, and we're going to send you out some of the basic, basics in estate planning and, and help do some real estate stuff for you as well, okay? Okie dokie. Thank you. All right. We have a great new year. Appreciate the phone call. Let me place you on a quick hold there. Hey, you're listening to Making Money Sense. Give us a ring, 855-ROSE-123. Let's bring Beth on from Ohio. Good morning, Beth. How are you today? I am well, thank you. How are you? I'm well. How can I help you? Um, my husband and I own a home, free and clear. We purchased it back in 2013 um, for a very minimal price. Um, we put some work into it, uh, and it is basically right now quadrupled in value because, again, we didn't buy something that was fancy. We made it fancy. Um, okay. We want to move in two years to um, a southern state where it's warmer. Um, we do have that two years that we have to wait at this point um, for family issues. Um, we're worried if we wait to sell that the market will go down and we won't receive the same amount then as we would if we sold it now and just rented a place for two years here in Ohio. Well, if that's what the, the concern is, then, then, then go ahead and sell it now and pocket the profits you have today and then rent for the next couple of years. Um, you know, that, that may give you the opportunity also to put, you know, to shop for a nice place. It, it can buy you some time to start shopping for a place down south. And you can possibly use some of the proceeds that you have from the sale of your current home in Ohio to make a nice down payment on a property somewhere in the south. And maybe you can even rent that out for a couple of years. So you have a lot of choices right there from what you're saying. Um, you know, but you can also apply some math to this too. And let's suppose that the value of your home, and I'm just going to make this up in, in Ohio, let's say is $700,000, okay? And what will it cost you if you rent in, in Ohio for two years? Let's suppose the rent is 25000 So over the course of two years, that's $50,000, right? So your house would have to drop a certain percentage, right? Um, you know, it's probably 7 or 8% uh, in order for, for you to lose that rent money. Do you see what I mean? So you're going to have to say, I'm going to spend money on rent, which is coming out of the proceeds from the house, do you follow what I mean? So that's kind of the math behind looking at your, your break-even point versus market values. But on the flip side, what happens if the property value continues to go up in Ohio? Okay? That's a possibility, too. So it boils down to this. Okay? It boils down to this, this question and this concept here. One, 
Are you happy with the return you have on your home if you sell it now? Will those proceeds be able, will those proceeds allow you to sort of turn the chapter, turn the page into a new chapter of life, harvest those profits, and then move on with the rest of your, your plan for you and your husband and your family in life? If the answer is yes, then the next question is, do you want to risk property values going down and you losing the ability to accomplish your next financial planning objective and goal in your family? Or are you happy with it? Or are you a gambler and say, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to roll the dice and try and get a little bit more out of this thing. So, so that's really where it boils down to as far as your risk-reward relationship on it all. But remember, when you do sell the property, if you did sell the property now and rent in Ohio, it's going to buy you time to shop in a southern state that you mentioned. And it's also going to give you the opportunity to consider buying it now or, and renting it out or just sitting tight in Ohio, renting, and then shopping, uh, you know, down, down south. So you've got a lot of, a lot of opportunities there, uh, you know, as far as all that goes. So, so I, th I think that it's, it's really just a math game and a risk-reward game on what you want to try to do. So can, do you have a uh, – do you, do, you, do, you, do you can even sell your property now and maybe rent it back. Maybe you can do a, a lease back from the new owner. Maybe an investor buys your property and they lease it back from you for two years so you don't have to move, right? So there, there's a handful of things that, that could unfold here. Uh, it's pretty interesting. You know, and then also if you do sell the property in Ohio and, and you want to buy a place down south, now you've got a rent payment in Ohio and a mortgage payment down south. How do you, how do you balance that? Does the cash flow work out enough for that to be, for that to be the case? Or do we have to take the proceeds from the Ohio home, put them into an income investment, you know, maybe something that has dividends of 7 or 8 or whatever percent, right, and then derive an income to make that mortgage payment for you down south as well. So handful of different choices right there. And if you want, I'll have somebody, you know, help you with the bath on it all. I'd be happy to, 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 to do that. I can put you on a quick hold, and, and we can have somebody reach out to you next week and sort of step you through that process if that's okay. Okay, let me go ahead and do that, Beth, for you. Appreciate the phone call. You have a good weekend. I'll place you on a quick hold here. Hey, you're listening to Making Money Sense. Give us a ring. It's open mic Saturday. We're talking about real estate here on phone calls. Real estate must be hot on people's mind. Give us a call, 855-ROSE-123. That's 855-767-3123. We're going to take a quick break here. We'll be back in a moment with more Making Money Sense. Listening to Making Money Sense live with Larry Rosenthal. Phone lines are open for your retirement and financial planning questions at 855 Rose 123. That's 855 767 3123. More Making Money Sense in a moment. There are still too many countries that give little or no assistance to disabled children. In third world nations, these children could be left alone while parents try to eke out a living. About 10 years ago, residents of Prince William and Fauquier counties in Virginia formed Children with Disabilities Fund International. It focuses on the needs of disabled children. CDFI's current work in Jamaica and Kenya supports about 300 disabled children and their families. For some of these children, they're getting the care they need for the first time in their lives. CDFI recently began an individual child sponsorship program in an effort to better meet the needs of these disabled children. To choose your child to sponsor, go to thecdfi.org. That's thecdfi.org. Your gift will help transform not only a disabled child's life, but the lives of their parents and of the surrounding community. Go to thecdfi.org. Make a difference. Go to thecdfi.org. You're listening to the Larry Rosenthal Show, 855-767-355. Oh, 5 Rose, one, two, three. Woo, there we go. 
One of those numbers, 855-ROSE-123, is the number you need to call right now to talk to Larry Rosenthal, who is live here in studio with us. Larry. Sure. In, uh, in Mark chapter 8, verse 36, it says, For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? Hmm. You know, we talk a lot about money on the show. We, we talk about how to create wealth, how to grow wealth. But it's the Lord that gives you the ability to go do that. In Ecclesiastes, it's very clear it says that, right? Mm-hmm. It says that. You know, so, so how do we figure out, how do we manage this stuff? How do we take the assets the Lord's given us, you know, and, and, and manage them in God's tools? You know, in Matthew, mm-hmm. Lord clearly says you can't serve two masters. Either you're going to hate one and love the other. You can't, you can't be devoted to God and serve money at the same time. You can't do that. Money's a tool, right? It's amoral, and, and it needs to be used in stewardship. Stewardship for what? Stewardship for the Lord. In Psalms, it's, you know, God says he owns everything, mm-hmm. right? So, so when you're looking at this, and, and now we're talking about money, one of the things that we have to bridge, we have to understand is, how do we use money in man's created tools, such things as retirement plans, investments, stocks, bonds, whatever it may be, real estate? How do we go about doing that, right? So I want to break down today a little bit about employer retirement plans. You know, employer retirement plans, so many people have so many access to them to save, and it's a great way to save. Right. I, I was speaking with somebody uh, two weeks ago and they said they just got a new job. They said, my employer matches four percent. What should I put in? I said, at least four percent because you're getting 100 percent on your money. Right. Yeah, and they said, oh, that wow. makes sense. Right. Free that makes money. a lot of sense. Exactly. Yeah. So in looking at employer plans, like most employer plans, not all, not all. OK, because we see a lot of them come through, but most employer plans uh, supposedly have low-cost investment choices, funds, ETFs, things of that nature. For the most part, that's true. They're very competitive, but they're not the lowest that's in the industry. You know, so, so how, do you, how do you utilize this? How do you use your employer plans? Now, remember this. When you're saving money, that's one thing. Then the investments is another thing. And then withdrawing money in retirement is a third thing. And not all employer plans are alike. Not all employ- all, most employer plans are set up in a fabulous way to save and grow money. Okay? Now, investment choices are usually limited, so sometimes you don't get all the investment capabilities that are, that are out there in the market. But that's, that's a different story. <clears throat> the biggest problem that we see in the industry is when somebody has money at their old employer and they want to start withdrawing it in retirement years. Mm -hmm. A lot of times there's some gotchas, there's some catches when it comes to investment choices once you leave, when it comes to fees and sometimes when you leave, when it comes to the ability to transfer assets at death to a to a spousal beneficiary or a non-spousal beneficiary. You know, and, and employer plans for the most part also have not kept up with the products that are available out there. Most employer plans don't have hedged mutual funds, hedged ETFs, high dividends. Some of them avoid sectors. Some, some plans, you know, like if you take, take a look at the government TSP, the thrift savings plan, you can't invest directly in a real estate sector or technology mm-hmm. sector or finance sector or emerging market sector. You just have, you know, in that case, you have five, five investment vehicles, the CGFS and I funds. You know, it's the largest employer in the country. And people are putting money in there. They don't understand how it works. But when you, when you take a look at, at the TSP, it's a great vehicle for saving dollars, saving money. And, and this, is, this is the easiest one to really sort of talk about a little bit here. Uh, because there's so many people that, that are involved in it all across the country. But you have to look at your employer's plan, your individual employer's plan, if you're in the private sector, and ask these questions. How does it look with the money going in? What are my investment choices cost? And then also, how does it look when it comes out on the other end? That's the important part. You know, if you look at the TSP, it's very limited when it comes to pulling money out. 
Okay, there's there's more flexibility in in IRAs. There's greater investment choices, professional management, Roth conversion opportunities, and ability to control distributions better. In the in the government TSP, as an example, when when you're looking at at distributing dollars to yourself after retirement, after you separate service, you can do that, but you can only make one request every 30 days. Mm. So if you were to pull money out, let's say, Chris, on the 15th of every month, and then on the 25th that month, you needed, hey, I need to go in and buy some money because I'm going to the beach and I'm getting a new car on the way. No, you got to wait 30 days. Wow. So there's limits there on distribution. There's also limits if you were to pass and the money go to your spouse or a non-spouse. Okay, there's limits there. There's tax issues if money goes to a secondary beneficiary inside the TSP after the primary owner passes to the tertiary beneficiary. There's instant distribution and a lot of taxes versus in IRAs. That's not necessarily the case. Am I hearing you say that you really shouldn't use the TSP? Just use a not at all side thing going on here. No, I'm a big fan of saving money in the TSP. Okay, I'm a big fan of putting money into employer retirement plans, Chris. Especially Absolutely. if they match, right? Because that's free money. Oh yeah, the TSP has a great matching program, five yeah. percent. One on yeah, no, it can't be no, bad. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is this. This is what I'm saying here is, you know, the Lord has blessed people with income with assets and our role is to be a good steward with them and now we have the challenge of putting those dollars in man's tools mm -hmm. whether it's the TSP or another 401k plan or 403b plan or SEP or KEO or whatever it may be we have to understand the rules of engagement of these different plans because not all plans are the same okay we need to get educated on all of this stuff how does the money act when it goes in should I put money on the pre-tax side or on the Roth tax-free side? What are my investment choices? And then how does the money act when I separate service and need to start withdrawing money? You know, you take a look at most employer plans, like I mentioned, they're, they don't keep up with the investment vehicles, mutual funds, ETFs, and things like that, that are out there in the industry. You know, today there's a lot of mutual funds and a lot of ETFs that do hedging for you. You know, if the market drops a certain percentage in the first quarter or, or, or in a quarter of a year, you don't lose anything or, or you eat that, then they eat the next 15%. I mean, there's, there's a lot of downside protection vehicles out there now that aren't available in these plans. There's high dividend pro programs in value stocks, in tech stocks. There's a lot of different invest. I was speaking with one of the younger advisors in my office this past week, and I explained to him, I said, you know, when I was your age, I never dreamt that we would have the ability to, to offer clients these types of, of sophisticated products that actually work. You know, and I told him, I said, mark this day, take a look at what's out there and wait till you see what 10 years looks like. Mm what we're going to be able to do and provide for clients as far as maintaining wealth, tax efficiency, income distribution, things of that nature. So my point is understand what's inside your employer's plan. And when you go to retire, when you go to separate service from your employer, okay, understand what your role, what your, your option, your options are. One, you can leave it there. Absolutely. A hundred percent. You can leave it there. You can do a conversion to a Roth IRA. You can pull it out and spend it. OK, you can roll it over into another employer's plan and you can also roll it over to your own IRA account. And what are the pros and cons of all five of those? That's where the conversation starts. You know, a lot of times when people save money, Chris, they save, save, save all their life in, re in employer retirement plans, which is a great thing. And I, I, I applaud that and I support that 100 percent. But now your investment objectives sometimes change when you go to retirement. Now, not only do you need growth for the future, because if you retire at 65, what about 75, 85, and 95? you got 30 more years. But now you also, in some cases, have to start kicking income out. So now you've got a different investment vehicle. How are your employer plans set up to do distribution planning? 
And a lot of times they're not. Yeah. The investments inside of them just aren't conducive to what your objectives have changed to. So again, understand what your investment choices are. Understand the platform, if you would, you know, and, 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 and really take a look at it. And, and it's amazing sometimes when people go, I never knew this before about my plan. It's done great to this point. That's exactly right. It has. The retirement plans at employers are wonderful, growing vehicles, but a lot of times they're not set up in the best way to reduce, uh, uh, to provide income down the road. Let's welcome Reggie on the line from Maryland. Good morning, Reggie. How are you today? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm well. How can I help you? <clears throat> um, so I sold my home back in December and made a sizable profit from it that's currently just kind of sitting in my savings account. Um, I plan on using about 65 k of that for my home that's being built, and it's due to be ready in March or April. Um, and I'm just wondering, in the meantime, can I invest that money somewhere and still be able to easily kind of pull it out once um, I go to settlement on the new house? So, yes, you can, and I would not put it at risk. So I would tell you to put it into a CD at a bank or a treasury bill. When, when, is, when do you need to put the, the rest of the down payment in? Um, and to, right now, anticipating probably either late March or mid-April. Oh, for this year? Yes, this year. Then I would so, put it into okay. a one-month CD, a one or, or, or three, uh, a one or a three-month CD, or a, or a one-month or three-month Treasury bill. That that's exactly what I would do. I would not take any risk with it at all. Okay. Okay. N not not at all. And there's a difference between, you know, the one of the things is on the Treasury bills you would pay federal income tax on the interest, not state, whereas in a bank CD, you're going to pay state and federal income tax. And in a bank CD, if you need to pull the money out before that time has expired, like if you sign up for three months and you need to pull it out two weeks before the three months is over, you could be subject to a penalty. Whereas in the Treasury bill, there is no penalty. You're just going to get the interest to date that you pull out when, when you pull it out. So, so they give you a little bit better flexibility and, and, or liquidity, I would say. And probably at this stage of the game where we are a little bit higher interest rate and better tax efficiency for yourself. So that's what I would take a look at. And if you want, we'll send you information on Treasury bills, show you how you can purchase them. But it's just a real quick you know, scenario uh, right there. So you're not talking about a lot of money here, Reggie, um, So and a very, very short period of time. So I would not take any risks. So either bank CD or treasury bill, okay? okay? Yep, I'll place you on hold, and we'll send you out information on the differences there. Appreciate the phone call, and congrats on the new home. That's exciting very much. Yes. So, hey, give awesome. us a call at 855-ROSE-123. That's 855-767-3123. Go visit my website, LarryRosenthal.com. Sign up for our newsletter. Follow us on YouTube at LarryRosenthal.tv. Subscribe there and uh, check out the website underneath webinars and and uh, future events tab. We've listed out all of our educational classes that we're going to be doing for everybody around the country this, this, uh, this year. Usually we just put them up one month at a time, but for some reason this year we decided we're just going to list out the whole syllabus and you can start uh, next week. We're going to have links up there where you can start registering uh, ahead of time. There's no cost for these and we just want to continue to provide you proper financial education uh, you know, going forward there. So, hey, we're going to take a quick break here. Give us a call at 855-ROSE-123, 855-767-3123. Listening to Making Money Sense live with Larry Rosenthal. Phone lines are open for your retirement and financial planning questions at 855 Rose 123. That's 855 767 3123. More Making Money Sense in a moment. And here's another Money Minute with Larry Rosenthal. So many different ways to invest money lump sum deposits buy and hold, market timing. How about dollar cost averaging? Put the same amount of money into the same investment at every interval, whether it's monthly, quarterly, annually, whatever it may be. 
This gives you the greatest opportunity to get the average price over the long term of the investment because one of the secrets to creating wealth is the acquisition of shares. You want to keep buying more and more shares over time. On the flip side, when you're in your retirement years and you want to distribute dollars to yourself for income, do the same thing in reverse. Dollar cost average out during your retirement years. You've seen and heard him on Fox Business, CNBC, and The Wall Street Journal. Larry Rosenthal is here right now to take your calls at 855-767-3123. That's 855-ROSE-123. This is The Larry Rosenthal Show. Welcome back to The Larry Rosenthal Show, 855-767-3123, 855-ROSE-123. To talk to Larry Rosenthal here in studio. Estate equalization. Is uh, state equalization, Chris. Wyoming's better than uh, South Dakota? <laughs> That's state, right? Oh. I don't know about that, okay? I don't know. I guess we'll go out there and find out, right? Uh, all 50 states are better than the others. Okay. okay. Put it go. that way. How's that? That's sound? equalization, right? Yeah, yeah. So, no, let's talk a little bit about estate equalization. Estate. This came, Got it. Oh. Yeah, estate. <laughs> yes, estate. This came up recently. And it is, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm famous for always talking about financial blind spots. And this is a, a true financial blind spot in, in people's financial planning, estate equalization. You know, you, you have one child who, you know, you, when, when you're dealing with this a lot of time, you're, you're dealing with heirs that are adult children. And suppose you have one adult child who comes across hard times. And maybe you're, you're helping him or her financially. And then you're starting to think about, well, what happens if you pass? How do you equalize that out? Because theoretically, that one child received, inf received assets before. So there's less assets now to pass on to both kids. Mm -hmm. How do you equalize that? How do you do this? What is fair distribution? Sometimes equals not always fair as well. Depends on which one of the kids you ask, right? <laughs> it depends on which one you ask. That's correct, Chris. So, so how do you take a look at, at a state distribution? How do you, first of all, sit back and figure that out? You know, uh, you know a lot of people say, you know, oh, we have a lot of clients that, you know, they've got grandkids, and, 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 and they put the same amount of money exactly on the exact same day into the 529 plans for the grandkids. So everything's as even as possible. And I love that. But how do you do a state equalization? Should you do a state equalization? How does it, how does it play out? You know, what about the complexity of assets that you're passing on? Seems like every family's different, isn't it? 100%. That's where I'm going. Yeah. Everything is different, but yet it's the same because you're not taking anything with you right? You're leaving everything behind. Heirs, charities, the IRS, we already know that. I'm going to figure out a way, Larry. I'm not sure how. But you are? Yeah. I figured you would, okay? <laughs> um, there's a lot of jokes about that. I can get into that, but that's, <laughs> we'll do that afterwards, okay? okay? So what about, you know, when you do have complex assets, you know, investment accounts, business interests, right? Real estate. Uh, how do you equalize all of that and avoid family disputes? Think about this. And I'm, I'm asking the question, how do you do that? There's no answer. The answer is you sit down and have to roll up your, your, your sleeves and, and, and put some you know, elbow, elbow grease of time into this equation. How do you figure this out? And the best way that I've been able to explain how this happens for people is to simply sit down and write out your assets and then start drawing lines across the paper of who you want to get and when. Yeah. What about the valuation of assets? What if you had business interests that were doing well and real estate, and for some reason the real estate market took a dump and you were going to leave some business to one person and some real estate to another? Oh, and yeah. then all of a sudden so valuations yeah. drop or yeah. exceed. Then what happens? What happens if you're looking at saying, well, this investment account is going to go to this child and that investment account is going to go to that child and their family, and then you have different evaluations on the date of death? Do people do that? 
I mean, do they change? Yes. They change it up like we that? see this all the time. We see lots of things. Well, no, this IRA here is for the nieces and the nephews. And there's different and, investments in it. Yep. Yep. Oh, wow. How do you how do you equalize that? How do you how do you simply say I've got I've got my investment account here with a beneficiary attached to it, but my will says each person's going to get five percent of all this other stuff. Yeah. Which one overrides? These are blind spots that are left on the table at the beneficiaries for them to sit down and go, okay, how do we figure this out, right, without having issues at the upcoming Thanksgiving dinner, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, here comes Chris. He's not going to get out. the he, – he doesn't get seconds because I know what he got in the investment That's account, right. right? That's right. Okay? But, you know, we make fun of this in, 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 in a light way here on the radio show. Oh, but these are serious. real planning issues. Yeah. What about debts and liabilities? You know, I can equalization. Leave I can leave mine to you if you want. You can have my debts <laughs> there you and go. liabilities. No, Bob gets all the debts. I get assets, right? <laughs> okay. okay. Equalization takes into account not only the assets, but also outstanding debts and liabilities, you know, of the person who's passing. Um, how does that balance out as well? What about the family dynamics? You know, how does that play out? Well, I, 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 I never liked, you know, their, their, this, that, or the other. What about the, 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 the heirlooms, you know? Oh, yeah. Um, so estate planning, again, just some blind spots. And then what about timing of distribution? Timing. Do you want your estate to be liquidated right away and everybody get on with the rest of their life? Or are there reasons, because of certain asset types, the complexity of an asset, to distribute that asset out over time. How does that work? And then do you want bloodline protection? How do you deal with that, with bloodline protection? Do you want to make sure that those assets always remain in your bloodline? If there's a premature death, God forbid, or a divorce, God forbid, mm -hmm. and half those assets walk away to someone else. Okay? Um, you know, I, I actually know of an attorney who, who uh, he's, he, he, he's older, but... Unfortunately, his parents made a mistake when he was young, and he got disinherited accidentally, okay? Um, and, and so this stuff happens all the time. So my point is, again, from an educational perspective, stop and think about this. Yeah, Larry, we've got a lot of questions sitting here in the chat. I'm popping them up on the screen there for you. So. Okay. Uh, can you – what is this here? Timothy wants to know if uh, he can't – can you transfer your employer plans after 55 while you're still employed? Uh, most cases, no. If you have money in an employer-sponsored plan and you're under 59 and a half, you cannot do what's called an in-service rollover or an age-based withdrawal. So it falls under age-based withdrawal or in-service rollovers. Once you're 59 and a half and you're still working at your current employer and still contributing, then you can do an age-based withdrawal or in-service rollover. You can pull the money out. A lot of times you can pull 100% out. Sometimes it's only 70 or 50%. It depends on the plan document. But you can pull that money out in a tax-free rollover into your own IRA. And then you can still contribute it into um, – uh, you can still contribute going forward. And the company will still match. The company, company doesn't match on balances. They match on each contribution. So you got to be 59 and a half to trigger that event. Okay. L um, Lacey wants to know, uh, she wasn't aware of the TSP tax implications to beneficiaries, spouses, and kids. When she passes, are these funds uh, to, uh, are they federally, uh, fed and state tax? Uh, yes, yeah. they are. Okay. Yes. So, and, and then, so, so here, um, Lacey, this is a scenario here where you have to take a look at distribution planning. One, one day when you separate service from your employer, how, how does that money come back to you to supplement income? And then, two, what happens if you pass away with that money at your employer? How does that employer's plan affect your beneficiaries? And maybe what happens if your beneficiary has the money there? There could be more restrictions on a non past employee having money at that old employer they 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 really try to move things out they they don't want to deal with people that from that scenario yeah. so you have to really take a good good solid look at it yeah claudia wants to know about it step-by-step -step instructions on how to buy treasury bills uh, website's confusing to her do we have that available we do okay. so claudia we can send you out some information on that but step-by-step -step, 
The easiest way to do it is through a brokerage account. Have the advisor go ahead and just purchase the T-bills for you. There's some advantages doing that versus going online to, to uh, treasury.gov. There's some restrictions on liquidations and flipping them to the next one if interest rates go up. So, Claudia, we can uh, send you out some information on, on, on that as well for you. So, hey, these questions are coming in from the, from the, uh, the chat box on YouTube. So you can go to LarryRosenthal.tv and send us off a question there, written question right there, or you can give us a call at 855-ROSE-123. We'll be back next Saturday with another session of Making Money Sense. Have a great weekend, everybody.